Welcome to the USS Silverside Submarine Museum, a museum dedicated to the efforts and accomplishments of the veterans who fought in World War II. The museum behind me is a 15,000 square foot facility. We are located at 1346 Bluff Street in Muskegon, Michigan, very close to Pier Marquette Park, and of course, right on the channel that connects Muskegon Lake to Lake Michigan. Currently, there is a course on World War II history being offered at the museum every Monday night from 6 till 9 p.m. Two instructors from Muskegon Community College have developed this course, and in cooperation with the college, the class is being offered here at the museum. Throughout the 15 weeks, each evening will have a different instructor, a different speaker, a different presenter with a specific expertise. The class is attended by students who have enrolled for credit and the museum has made the offer to the community members to attend this lecture series if they so wish and do so free and of course donations are graciously and generously accepted. The topics throughout the course, if I may read from the notes that I have about the course, began on January 7th with a, the topic of from Versailles to Munich, talking about the transition from World War I to World War II. Subsequent weeks cover the topics of the German Blitzkrieg, Blitzkrieg crushing Poland, England stands alone, Hitler's dilemma, Operation Barbarossa about Russia, Pearl Harbor awakening the sleeping giant, the Pacific Theater, defeating the Desert Fox, and Muskegon, the arsenal of democracy. We invite you to come to the Silversides Museum on Monday evening, beginning Monday, January 14th, 6 p.m., to enjoy a very interesting evening about World War II history. I'm only going to speak for a very short time about the Muskegon County World War II Veteran Project. If you look at these 100 pictures, and multiply it by 20. That's what I've completed so far, but I'm only beginning because I'm estimating there were 20,000 men and women who served in World War II from Muskegon County, and I'll be about 115 when I finish this project. Well, it can't be finished, of course, but I can make a pretty big dent, but only with your help. The first year that I was doing this, it was so easy, I just went around and talked with my cousins and my uncles and my neighbors and my Sunday school teachers and my high school teachers, the veterans I already knew. Well, I used them all up. For the last two and a half years, I've been dealing with complete strangers that I've never heard of before. The only way I can find them is if you tell me about your dad and your uncle or your aunt or your cousin who served in World War II. I don't know who they are, but if I get a phone call from you, I can include that person too, if there is a photograph. I'm just gonna ask for a show of hands because I see some pretty familiar faces here. How many of you know for sure that you have a relative who died in World War II? Oh, okay. That tells you something, doesn't it, about the effect that the, the greatest, or I should say the most horrible war in, Amer in uh, human history had just on Little Muskegon County. I'm going to feature a couple of people. Pat, could you come up and tell us about your life? Well, this is something that I'm not accustomed to doing. Thank you, Pip. I'd like to uh, recognize my brother who's sitting over here. He was um, three months old when my dad was killed, and I was three. Actually, when I say killed, he is an MIA. We never found him. They never found him. Um, he's on the wall at the cemetery. Um, I didn't really know what to expect when I got here, so I brought a couple things, just things that are special to me, um, that are 
mind from him. And um, I forget how to talk into these microphones. I don't know how to do it. First of all, I cannot remember him physically. I do not remember him touching me, holding me, talking to me. Um, I wish I could remember him, but in his love for me, he did this baby book. And it's very special. What's special is because it's in his handwriting. He cared for me. And um, all the gifts I got when I was born. But what he did, he cut off a piece of my hair and gave it a book. And he bought a ring and put it on my finger. And he wrote all these things in this book. He hoped that I would not grow up to be red-headed like he was. But my mother always wished for a red-headed grandchild. And the other thing that I want to share is something that he sent to me from Ford, F-E-N-N-I-N, Fennin, in Texas. And it's a message from him to me. Just a simple little apron. But it says, <clears throat> Daughter, forget me not. And thank you, Debbie, for giving me the chance to remember him. And thank you, all of you, for remembering him. Thank you for sharing. All right, well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our lecture this evening. Like uh, my wonderful professor said, I am Emily Kroll, and I've been attending this class since the beginning, like some of you out there, and this is my third year at Muskegon Community College. Now, when I was first asked to uh, do this presentation this evening, I thought to myself, if there was one thing that I could share about everything that I've learned about World War II this semester, I think, and I know now because I'm going to present on it, that the thing that has stuck out in my mind the most out of all the places in World War II, from England and bombings on London, to Germany, to France, to Russia, to all the islands in the Pacific, the one thing that sticks out to me is the Shuri Line. And hopefully tonight I'll be able to uh, l convey a little bit of the intensity of the battle on Okinawa and the struggles that our soldiers faced while they were there. Now, the Shuri Line is on Okinawa, and a little fact about Okinawa, it is a tiny, minuscule island that is about one-third the size of Rhode Island, which, of course, is the United States' smallest state. So this was an operation by the U.S. Army and the Marines on a tiny little speck in the ocean. Now, the 10th Army and the Marines, both the 1st and 6th Divisions, landed on Okinawa, April Fool's Day, 1945, and amazingly, they were landing almost unopposed. Now, squad leaders had been told, telling their troops on the transport ships to expect 50 to 80 percent casualties on the beach. So when they landed and only had 28 killed, 104 wounded, and 27 missing, they were shocked. Now, upon landing on the island, the Army and the Marines split up. The 1st and 6th Marine Divisions moved north to secure what was about two-thirds of the island in the mountainous region where they were expecting the majority of the Japanese resistance to be. 
and the 10th Army moved south towards the area known as Shuri. Um, on April 4th is when the 10th Army encountered the resistance and the defenses at Shuri, but the 1st and 6th Marines had a relatively easy time up in the north and had the entire two-thirds of the island secured on the 20th of April. Now, this is the Shuri Line, and it is near the southern portion of Okinawa, and I want to point out a few things to you here. Now, initially, the Shuri Line composed of all this area here, and what it was, was the Japanese had dug in defenses of caves and interconnecting tunnels with horrendously well done firing forts that were camouflaged. So when the army came south, they came right through here towards the middle, towards this area, which is the town of Shuri and Shuri Castle, and then also the capital of Okinawa is Ta Naha right there. But they encountered this resistance and stopped dead. By the 20th of April, they had only moved a matter of a half a mile against these defenses. So, once the 1st and 6th Marines had the North secured, they moved and came south to assist the Army. Now, these dark line here are the initial dividing lines between the Army and the two Marine divisions. And what we're going to see is as the battle progresses, this dividing line between the 6th Marine Division and the 1st Marine Division is going to shift. And as our troops successfully get past the first line of defenses, the Japanese simply move farther south to another set of defenses. So that in a course of about two months, three months if you count the length of time that the army had been engaged, they only come down to this area, which is the last Japanese defenses. Now this is only an area of about four miles north to south, it's about six miles across. So that is an incredible amount of time to cover a relatively small distance. And that is a wonderful and horrible example of just how well the Japanese were defending their island. And they knew that Okinawa was the last step between the Americans and the home world of Japan. So they were ferocious in their defense. Now, I want to talk a little bit about just how they managed to hold off Army and Marines for such a long amount of time. And it is mostly because they had almost perfected the system of island defense. Now, I say almost because, well, we did manage to break through in the end, but what they would do is in their caves and in their tunnels, they would have armored doors in the front of their heavy artillery and machine guns. And what would happen is when the Marines would move forward, they would open the doors and begin firing. Now, what happens? Well, the Navy and the ocean off, off the coast sees the flashing from the guns and they see the flashing from the artillery and they shoot and they completely shell the, wherever they see the flashing light. So what the Japanese did is they put those armored doors on. So they would open and shoot and close the doors. In comes Navy Barrage. Guess what? The armors, it's still there. So the Japanese have become amazing at defending their fortifications. And also, I have here an example of what every Japanese soldier was huh, equipped with. Now this is an Arasaka rifle, and every Japanese soldier was equipped with one of these. Well, every Japanese infantry soldier. Now, it do this is a later war model. It was made probably in 1944, and I would love to be able to talk to you about the differences in the manufacturing with this weapon and the weapons they used earlier in the war, but it's important to know that the Japanese were willing to fight to the last man to defend their island. And this is the sort of thing, and in fact, rifles just like this is what our Marines and, so, and Army 
or facing on the slopes of these fortifications. And also, the Japanese had a wonderful system, and by wonderful I mean horrible, of infiltration. At night, while well, the soldiers are bogged down in their foxholes, trying to get in some whatever sleep they can get on the front lines, the Japanese would sneak in, dive into their foxholes, and try to eliminate as many enemy, or in our case, friendly soldiers as they could. And this is a World War II Japanese bayonet. And uh, I don't know about you, but if this was sneaking at me in the dark, and all of a sudden it jumped down in my foxhole, I would be pretty terrified. So the Japanese were very good at scaring the, the US soldiers and keeping them on their toes and also uh, really good at digging tunnels and defending them. Now, I didn't point it out on that map, but on the eastern edge of the island of Okinawa and right on the southeastern edge of the Shuri Line, there are two hills. And I'm going to use these two hills to try and illustrate a little bit of the intensity of the Japanese offenses and what our American troops had to battle through to get to Shuri and to get to Naha and eventually secure the island on the 24th or the 21st of June. Now Sugarloaf Hill is located again on the eastern edge of the Shuri line and it is a very unopposing hill you would think. It's about 50 feet high and 300 yards long. So we'll call this more of a mound uh, on the top of the ground. Now the 6th Marine Division uh, began their assault of the hill around the 9th of May. And what happens is, remember this is a 50 foot high hill, it takes them 12 days to secure this hill. The Japanese had of course dug in, they had their well camouflaged firing ports, they had minefields and anti-tank batteries so that tanks were really rendered almost unable to support the ground troops. So in those 12 days, the, uh, the Marines made 11 attempts to capture the hill. Now in those 11 attempts, 1,656 Marines were killed and another 7,429 were injured. 11 attempts, 12 days, almost 9,000 men. That makes Sugarloaf Hill the highest death count, casualty count, per square foot of any contested area in World War II. This is a picture of Sugarloaf Hill and after the battle, and what you can't see here is in the foreground of the picture, there is a road. And what you're looking at, this is a picture taken from the road and there's a little embankment right in the front of, a, in front of the, the hill here where the Marines were dug in so that they were trying to come up, cross this barren area that was completely reduced to ashes and, and dirt by the shelling from the Navy barrages that they called in to support them. So that is the world's deadliest hill. Now the other hill I would like to discuss with you is Half Moon Hill. Now we saw in the Sugarloaf Hill what happens with the intensity of the Japanese defenders, but it wasn't just the Japanese that our troops were fighting. Now the Half Moon Hill was the job of the 1st Marine Division, and I was fortunate enough to read a wonderful book that was the personal account of one of the soldiers who was forced to live on the, and survive on the slopes of Half Moon Hill. His name was Private First Class Eugene Sledge of the 5th Regiment, 1st Marine Division. And I would like to use some of his words to illustrate to you just how terrible conditions were on this hill. Now, right after they secured Sugarloaf Hill on the 21st of May, it began to rain. And the last couple of days, we've seen a little bit of rain here, but this wasn't a drizzle with uh, an hour or two off. It was basically 10 days of straight downpour. And this is what 
Mr. Sledge had to say about this downpour. He said, the almost continuous downpour that started on the 21st of May turned one a draw, which was on the upper area between the upper edge of Sherry Line and the Half Moon Hill. Um, it turned one a draw into a sea of mud and water that resembled a lake. Tanks bogged down and even Amtrak's could not negotiate the morass. Living conditions on the front line were pitiful. Supply and evacuation problems were severe. Food, water, and ammunition were scarce. Foxholes had to be bailed out constantly. The men's clothing, shoes, feet, and bodies remained constantly wet. Sleep was nearly impossible. The mental, the mental and physical strain took a mounting toll on the Marines. Making an almost impossible situation worse were the deteriorating bodies of Marines and Japanese that lay just outside the foxholes where they had fallen during the five days of ferocious fighting that preceded Company K's arrival on Half Moon. So after the Marines secured Sugarloaf Hill and eventually Half Moon Hill and the rest of the Shuri Line, that pretty much makes the end of the struggle on Okinawa. The 6th Marine Division, after conquering Sugarloaf Hill, proceeded almost directly to the capital city of Naha, which they entered on the 24th of May. On the 29th of May, the 1st Marines entered the city of Shuri and secured the castle. Now, fighting would continue for a couple more weeks, and on June 18th was the end of the battle for the Kanushi Ridge, which saw the end of organized resistance on Okinawa. After that battle, many of the Japanese high command um, committed suicide and died with what they would consider honor and left their troops to wage guerrilla warfare where they could. And that battle was just over 1,000 casualties for the 1st Marine Division. So a few days after that, we have the Major General Roy Geiger, who was in charge of the operation after the death of Buckner, announces that this island is secure, and we see the end of the last battle of World War II. So what did this battle cost? Um, last week, actually, it was two, last, two weeks ago, we saw some of the numbers of the casualties from this operation, but here we have more categorized totals, I will say. You have 7,613 troops killed and missing, 31,807 wounded, and another 26,221 non-battle casualties. And this, of course, is the highest casualty count that the American Army and Marines saw during the entire Pacific Campaign. This breaks down some of those numbers. The Marines, with their attached naval medical personnel that they called corpsmen, um, saw 20,000, just around 20,000 casualties. The 1st Marine Division alone, which saw the majority of the fighting and were charged with tackling some of the worst areas of Japanese resistance, had just over 7,000 casualties. And Company K of the 5th Regiment, 1st Marine Division, which was the company that was Eugene Sledges, um, they entered the island, they landed on D-Day with 235 men. With the number of replacements that were flooded in after other members of their company had been wounded or killed, there was a total of 485 men that served in that one company. At the end of Okinawa, 50 of those 485 men were uninjured. 26 of those men had landed on Okinawa the 1st of April. The Japanese saw complete and utter destruction. There was counted just over 107,000 enemy dead, 10,000 troops surrendered, and the Marines estimate there were about 20,000 more Japanese troops that were sealed in caves or buried by their own forces. But those numbers pale in the comparison 
to the civilian casualties, and it's difficult to find a rough or an accurate number on the total number of Okinawan civilian casualties, but the rough estimate is somewhere between 100,000 and 150,000 dead civilians from an island that was 16 miles long and 6 miles wide. Um, could you imagine the destruction that would have ensued if the American Army and the American Marines were forced to invade Japan? This is what I would like to leave you with tonight. Now this is the closing statement from Mr. Sledge's book, which I would highly recommend to anyone who is interested in the war in the Pacific. But he said this, until the millennium arrives and countries cease trying to enslave others, it will be necessary to accept one's responsibilities and be willing to make sacrifices for one's country, as my comrades did. As the troops used to say, if the country is good enough to live in, it is good enough to fight for. With privilege goes responsibility. Our troops lived up to that responsibility on the Shuri Line in Okinawa. And we owe them our highest respect and our highest honor. Thank you. I just have to say a couple words about it. And I did, I, I was wounded bad enough that they shipped me off the island to Guam. I had surgery there, surgery on the Okinawa, surgery on Guam. And they still needed more, so they shipped me back to Hawaii. And I finally got enough doctors and equipment there that took it all out of my back as much as they could get. And I got better, and I lived a good life. But, you know, maybe I'm, I'm so proud of you. It's so good to hear you. <laughs> I'm reading a book, and it's all about Okinawa and the 96th Infantry Division. And I'll read it, and I will come back and, and, uh, and think about what you have said. But anyway, that's just a few words I wanted to say. And, and uh, uh, well, I'm glad I'm here. 87 years now I've lived, and I'm glad that I, I made it back. A lot of good friends, and many, 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 as Dick says, many, many friends of mine. I can name them forever. It's just, you know, well, anyway, when you, there's, there's probably dozens of you guys have been in combat, someplace in the war, someplace around. I see over here, there's Eric Goldman. Oh, all the things he could tell stories about, the things that happened to him and many of you others, but this is just one little stories, and, and uh, I'm proud to be in the Army, and I'm proud I got home, I married a great gal, had a great family, <laughs> I'm not going to talk anymore because I'm going to start thinking about these guys again. One fellow, one more, I just want to say one fellow lived in Wisconsin. We were on the ship rail, going to Okinawa. We had a sea runner. And he came up to me, he was married, twin daughters. I gave them. Show me the pictures. He says, Woody, that's Woody. You know, when your name is Woody, you're always you're Woody. Well, he says, Woody, I'm not going not going to make. I'm not going to make. I says, Sid, he was from another state, he was Sid Waterman. I said, Sid, you are. Yeah, ready share, good looking man, about 25, 24. Well, we got on the island, he went to another company next to mine. I was in G Company, 383rd, and he was company next to me, and he was killed. I heard about it later. He lived up in northern Wisconsin, and I, I didn't get, I didn't know when he was going to be home, or I would have gone up there. I didn't, I didn't know, but I got some paperwork, I got some stuff from the funeral. And boy, that, that tore me up <laughs> to read about him and get, you know, he was right. But this is, this is, this is thing. So I'm just thinking, no, I, I, I said too much, you know, I mean, it's just, before I start crying like a baby, I'm gonna get out of here. <laughs> Thank you.
here this evening is a person that we deeply respect. Kurt and I have its wonderful department chair. Her name is Kathy Tosa. <laughs> Kathy has a personal story to share about her mother, who was a German civilian in oh, Berlin. You weren't supposed to give that away. It was going to be a surprise. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> All right, now let's see. This is forward, I suppose. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I wanted to tell you just a little bit of a different perspective. Um, it's always wonderful to hear about the, the soldiers that fight and, and are out there and, and are defending their countries, um, both from uh, of both sides of, of the battle, actually. Uh, but they're always in the total war and the war, type of warfare that we now engage in, there's always a civilian side as well. And so I wanted to share um, the side from the perspective of the German civilian. Now let me see if this works. Aha, yes, there she is, and, and George let the cat out of the bag. This is my mother, this is Margot. Um, when the war started in Germany in 1939, uh, my mom was 15 years old, so younger than most of you here. Um, she um, said she remembers hearing that the war had begun. She came home, uh, and it had been announced on the radio, and um, that was the beginning of everything. She lived, she lived in Heidelberg, um, and uh, this is the, what the German country looked like at the beginning of the war here, and that's where Heidelberg is located. You maybe heard of Heidelberg, beautiful university town with a long history, um, and that's where my mother was living. Um, as the as the years went on, she uh, obviously a 15 year old. She's growing a little older. Um, she had finished with elementary school, and she went into um, uh, went to a language school, a Volksschule in Mannheim, which was nearby, and that was a school. Uh, that specifically trained translators. Um, they could study French, which my mother thought was wonderful. Um, she didn't really like English very well, but she had to study and learn some English. Uh, and they did a little Spanish also. And so she thought that was interesting and, and that she would um, study a little bit of language and didn't know exactly what she'd do with it, but and that, that was what she was working toward. Um, every day she would get up and ride the Oige, that was the name of the streetcar, that connected Heidelberg and Mannheim. Um, and it actually ran parallel uh, to the very first stretch of Autobahn. The Autobahn is the big superhighway system um, that's in Germany, and the very first stretch of it went from Heidelberg to Mannheim. But my mother didn't have a car, and uh, she rode the streetcar, and uh, for two years, um, she studied there at the school, learned her verbs, put the adjective endings on it, all those kinds of things that you have to learn, um, and did things that she could do as a, a young teenager in Germany. In 1941, uh, she and her mother moved to Mannheim um, early in that year. Um, and it was a, uh, Mannheim is a, a, a beautiful Baroque uh, palace there in Mannheim. Um, this was the, goes back historically, the Count of the Palatinate, a very powerful uh, guy in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, lived here in Mannheim, built a palace, had a beautiful water tower. It was a gorgeous city. Mannheim was beautiful. Um, it also, though, was an industrial center. And in 1941, uh, that doesn't bode well for any German city because that makes them then a target. Um, not only uh, was Mannheim a bond, uh, the industrial uh, center of Mannheim, but it was also the first time that the uh, bombing was a deliberate terror type bombing because not only did the bombers drop bombs on the, the targets, the military targets, but they also started bombing the city center um, and actually uh, pretty much obliterated uh, the center of Mannheim. This was the first time 
um, that this kind of terror bombing had been used, um, and um, it did produce terror. Um, my mother recalls that this was sort of the first time that she had experienced being bombed. Um, the officials near where she lived uh, had built a bunker. They lived by the tennis courts, and there was an above ground bunker, a high bunker they called it. Um, and so when the sirens went off, um, you ran to the nearest bunker and then you waited. It was still kind of new to my mom at this point in time, and not an every night occurrence yet. Um, but when you came out of the bunker then, and certainly in the morning, um, you saw whose house had survived and whose hadn't, and you saw the results of the bombing. From December 1940 already, that's when this terror bombing started, to March of 45, there were more than 150 attacks by either the RAF or by the United States Air Force um, on Mannheim. Um, this intense bombing, this terror bombing, um, was, um, was something that was new, uh, that had been, up until this point, uh, the bombing had always been very targeted on the industrial centers, uh, but no more. My mom said, um, as she was recalling this, uh, well, we, we really didn't know a lot what was going on. At this point in the war, there, weren't, there was no television, um, there were no newspapers being published, there was just the radio. And so um, you pretty much heard what the government told you. Um, and at this point, they were still being told, oh, they were winning. They were the sea guts. You know, but, but things were going really well for the Germans yet. And so that's, you believed what, you were, what your government told you. And so you went on about your life as best you can, which I'm sure is what people did in the United States as well. My mother studied. She, um, in the springtime of 1942, sat for her exam and became a certified translator. By now she was about 18 years old. Her birthday's in January, so she turned 18. Um, and she mastered all of those languages um, and was certified. And so um, she also had girlfriends, and one of her friends, Irmgard, um, had graduated the year before her and had a job in Berlin. Um, and there was another job available, and so my mother thought, well, that would be something that she could do. So she went to work for the Auswärtige Amt, uh, which is a listening post. Uh, they listened to French and British broadcasts. Um, they transcribed them, and then uh, those were the more skilled and more uh, practiced translators. And then my mom um, got to do the translations. So they analyzed the content and they attempted to glean information that would be helpful to their government and their war effort. Now, this is, you know, they, they put the headphones on and they listened and uh, the various radio, whoops, various radio reports um, were, were uh, written down and, and um, huh, I, they worked hard. There were about 25 of them. Um, they worked night and day in shifts. And they were located at the Say House um, on Wannsee, which is near Berlin. Um, you might recall from your history that Potsdam is also uh, on Wannsee. And that's where, of course, at the end of the war, um, the Allies will meet and divide up Germany. So in that same neighborhood. Um, Irmgard had that, a job there, my mom had a job there as well, um, and she would ride back and forth from Berlin out to Wannsee on the public transportation. Um, here we are going from Heidelberg um, up to Berlin. Uh, probably, oh, nowadays it would take you maybe five, six hours, something like that, uh, to make this journey. Now, my mother had the unlucky a knack of landing apparently where lots of bombs were falling. Um, she has no idea that this Battle of Britain began in November of 43 and goes to March of 44, uh, but 
she told me when we were talking about it, and I only sort of found it as I was then doing a little research, she said there were a lot more bombs in Berlin than there were in Mannheim. Uh, by the time the war's over, Berlin will be, ha, be have hit, been, been hit by about 314 uh, different air raids. Mom said, in the morning, the British bombed us, always at about 11 o'clock, and that had something to do with the amount of time it took you to get from England to Berlin. And then at night, that's when the Americans bombed us. So you could pretty much kind of uh, keep track of the time by the air raid sirens. And it was very much a daily occurrence to some of the, the B-17s uh, that are over Berlin there. This is a bunker. Um, the, in Berlin, bunkers were built uh, wherever possible, above ground, underground. A lot of the subway systems would be used for bunkers. Um, there was a bunker at the zoo. And actually, in the very first uh, bombing attacks on Berlin, the only elephant of the zoo was killed um, in that first bomb. Um, there, that was one of the, the Seoul bunker. Uh, the bunker at the zoo was really close to where my mom um, lived. She had an apartment there with her mother. Um, and so they would either go to that bunker or to the one there right by the apartment complex. Um, one day, uh, unfortunately at about 11 o'clock, she and her mom were out on the streets, the siren ran, went off, and she went, the two of them went rushing to the bunker, only to have it closed shut right in front of their face. They couldn't get in, they wouldn't open it up again, and so there they were, the sirens were blasting, the bombers were coming, and they were looking for shelter. Um, they ended up over a viaduct and under a bridge there, and as they squeezed in there, they realized that the other people taking shelter in that same spot uh, were prisoners of war from Poland. Um, so it was very uncomfortable uh, in that dark, confined area as everyone waited and prayed that the bombs wouldn't find them. I found a number of pictures of the bombers and Berlin and the rubble that would eventually be Berlin. There were lots of conflicting numbers of civilian population uh, that were killed, um, made homeless, wounded, uh, and during this Battle of Berlin, and the British and the American Air Forces felt that they could bomb the, the uh, capital into submission. Uh, but the Battle of Berlin really was not successful. Uh, they did not break the will of the German people, um, and they continued to, to fight on. Um, there are um, some horrific pictures uh, but uh, during the day, I thought it would be kind of interesting uh, to hear a little bit about what daily life was like. And so I asked my mom, she really doesn't talk much about this, and so I had to kind of talk to her and kind of pull it out of her uh, to get her to remember. Um, she talked about the fact, and I was interested in the food. You know, what, what did you eat in a situation like this? What kind of food was available? And not much. Uh, daily ration uh, was a bowl of soup, potato soup. Um, that sticks to your ribs. Uh, you would have a hard roll and jelly. And then the big joke was about the substitute coffee. Coffee, you know, everybody loves their cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, and the Germans didn't have any coffee available to them. The blockade would, had, was very effective. And so um, they made coffee out of roasted carrots. I don't know what that tastes like. Probably not very good. Uh, but the Berliners have this really weird sense of humor um, that has carried them on through right into the present, through the Cold War and the whole thing. And so they called their coffee Mucken coffee. And Mucken means insects. And so they would joke 
that the coffee was not made of coffee beans, but was actually ground up insects. Now, I don't know how that could possibly taste good, but that, you know, a little bit, Germans tend to have a little bit of what's called Galgenhumor, which is gallows humor. And so here's a little bit of Galgenhumor. When things are really bad, you just joke about it. Uh, and at this point in Berlin, things were not really good. Um, my mom said, well, you didn't have time to go shopping. You just went to work and you came home. Uh, but that was okay, because there was nothing to shop for anyway. Uh, there was no clothes available. Um, if you needed something, or if you outgrew something, or if you got a hole in something, you patched it. There were seamstresses. You got somebody else's cast off coat and had it remade. Um, you weren't fashion conscious at all. You were just interested in being warm and getting where you needed to get uh, all in one piece. She said there were very, very few men in Berlin at this time, and you can imagine why, obviously. Uh, public transportation functioned very, very well, um, but she said also every night um, there was that fear and that dread. You knew that those four million Berliners were going to be jolted out of their beds when the sirens went off and everyone went rushing to the bunkers. So there was always that, and in the nighttime it was always worse than during the day somehow. The Russians are coming, all right? The Russians are attacking from the east successfully. Um, the Russians are coming in 44 uh, with their tanks. Uh, my grandmother, Margot's mother, uh, had been in Berlin and had been on the eastern part uh, in Prussia, um, had, been, uh, had a job and was working uh, with um, the farmers, the German farmers that had, uh, had um, POW workers had those, uh, the uh, soldiers that had been captured were put to work on German farms. My grandmother was involved with organizing them. So as the Russians started advancing on Germany, on Berlin in particular, the Germans start fleeing from the eastern part of Germany, from Prussia and from all of those areas that are now Poland. Um, they walked, uh, and my grandmother walked as well. Um, she walked for many days ahead of the Russian army. And people, as they do, were discarding things along the way. So my grandmother was a very practical woman. And as she walked, she came upon a typewriter. And so she decided, oh, that'll be really good. And when things are better, they'll need secretaries. So she dropped what she had, and she picked up this typewriter and walked the rest of the way to Berlin, carrying the typewriter. Now the typewriter ends up getting left in Berlin. She doesn't, she can't get it on the train. Um, so the typewriter really didn't help, but she was thinking about how she could make, make things better in the future. So she was always planning, and she got the typewriter. Well, she gets to my mother and says, we have to leave. Uh, we absolutely can't stay here any longer. Um, the Russians are coming. The bombs are falling. We've got to get out of here. And she was absolutely right. The um, interesting fact that I came up with, and you can see it here in the pictures, uh, that by the time all of the air raids and then the bombardment uh, on Berlin was finished, that there were 39 cubic yards of rubble for each and every Berliner. So, my mother's job doesn't cease yet, the war isn't over, and so the listening post is continuing to listen. But now they're being transferred. They're being transferred from Berlin, where it's no longer tenable to maintain their position, and they're being sent back south again. They're being sent to the Black Forest, to the Dobel Mountain. Um, it's a, not a really large mountain. It's a, like the Appalachians, kind of a nice hill, Black Forest. Okay? Uh, so uh, the orders are, you have to report at the Dobel, but you have to get there on your own. Now, that was quite a feat because 
rail transportation was a mess. It was being strafed and bombed by uh, the British and the American uh, Air Force, and so you just had to hope for the best. My mother and my grandmother went here to the Anhalter Bahnhof, and you can see it had already been hit a number of times. It was just a shell. Um, they went there, they had one little suitcase, they packed food in it, and my mother laughed. She said they put pudding in the suitcase. That was the only thing we got out of Berlin with, was the clothes on our back and the pudding in our suitcase. Um, they went to the, to the Bahnhof, the train station, and they had to wait. They had to get on a train. The trains would come in, everybody would shove on, and then the trains would wait for a break in the bombing, and then they would leave. They waited for five days and five nights to get onto the train, pushing, shoving, you can imagine everyone in fear and terror uh, that they wouldn't make it. Eventually, Mom and, and my grandmother, with their little case, suitcase of pudding, got onto the train where they stood shoulder to shoulder for their trip to the Black Forest. It took five days. It took five days because this train uh, would be shuttled off when a military train had to come by. This train would also try to avoid the strafing and the bombing. And so the trip that nowadays takes five or six hours um, took five days. But eventually, they do get to the Black Forest and to the Doble. Um, my mom reports for duty. Uh, at the listening post, but things are not getting very good because now the French are attacking from that area and coming into that black forest into that area. Um, so the whole listening post picks up and flees to the woods thinking that they, they need to somehow get away from the, the French. Um, but the artillery starts shelling them and make some pretty close hits, and so the people in charge of the listening post decide that they will surrender. Uh, and with a white flag, um, my mom and this group, there are, there are a couple of young women uh, and these men, uh, and they walk out of the forest and surrender to the French. Well, they were immediately arrested because the French thought they might be connected to the military. They weren't. They were connected um, to the Auswärtige Amt, which wasn't the military, but the French didn't know that. So they immediately took my mother and her girlfriend, Jamgad, and locked them in a church with all the men, which was a really good thing, because that saved my mother from being raped. Because then the troops were let loose in the town. All the men and my mom and Jamgad were locked in the church. They were locked in the church for several days, um, they were scared to death, uh, but eventually uh, the troops were brought under control and then they moved on. And they were, and my mom and the men uh, were let out of the church. You can see here a little bit uh, where the French zone is located, that's in the blue. And the American zone there is in the gold. And you can see the Russian zone in the red. All right. So the French have come in, and these zones will be established a little bit later on, but these were now the areas that the armies were in control of. Um, so in the, the blue, just kind of the border there, let's see, did I put a star? Yeah, there's a star. Right, right there, that's kind of where my mom is at this point in time. Right. Um, when the, the French had now taken over this area and everybody was allowed to work. Um, you could go and work on the farms or you could work in the hotels and so and clean and so that's what my mother decided she would do. She worked at a hotel there on the Doble. Um, the Doble in the Black Forest is a beautiful area, lots of hiking trails, lots of skiing. It's very much like our Appalachians. Um, so she decided that she would uh, clean the hotel um, in exchange for food. Um, and uh, she laughs about the soup that they were always served. It was a vegetable soup, very healthy, right? Uh, and in order to, to have a little fat on the soup and a little flavoring on the soup, they would take the paper 
that the margarine had been wrapped in, not the margarine itself, but the paper, and you lay the paper on the top of the soup, and then you lift it up, and ah, oh, you have that fat, the eyes, they called them, the eyes, looking back at you. That was a good soup if there was fat in the soup. So that's what they ate. Um, they went out and gathered blueberries uh, from the, the uh, mountain and the little bitty tiny ones, not like our big Michigan Jersey berries at all. Um, they, so they, they were able to work in exchange for food, but they figured that uh, this was not the place. Both she and Irmgard had uh, family that were just inside the American zone. Right, just kind of beyond the star there a little bit. And so they decided that they were going to try and get to Heidelberg. Um, they wanted to get back to their families. Um, and so uh, the, there was not a lot of movement allowed in between the zones. Uh, but they decided that they were going to maybe not sneak out. Uh, but when the truck came that was delivering all the vegetables, then they would just kind of go along with it when it left. And so that's what they did. Uh, they get, hopped into the back of this truck um, and drove down the mountain. And when they got down to the end of the mountain, or the bottom of the mountain, they still had to make their way north. Um, and so they walked down the Autobahn, where there was no cars at this point in time. Um, and they walked, oh, 35, 40 miles or so uh, north. Uh, Irmgard went to Heilbronn, and my mom went on to Heidelberg. Um, it took them a couple of days, um, and they slept uh, in a haystack there where the farmers, um, for one of the nights um, on, on their way. Now, Heidelberg hadn't been bombed. Let's see here. Heidelberg hadn't been bombed at all. Um, there was a, there's a story about the American um, who was leading the bombing raid and had, had connections with Heidelberg, had studied there as a young man and said, oh, we don't need to bomb Heidelberg. There's, no, there's nothing industrial, military of worth here. Uh, we'll spare it. And they did. Um, there was no bomb damage in Heidelberg. And so that's where the 7th Army decided to make its headquarters. So uh, when my mom got back there, and her mother was there as well, it was a little bit interesting, but that's another story. I'll tell that later. Um, so my mom uh, and my grandmother were there. The war's coming to an end. The Americans are occupying this zone. Um, they're setting up offices, and they're um, beginning to encourage um, and help the Germans, because winter is coming. They need, to, they need to get the German um, economy back on its feet a little bit. We don't want these people um, to be without um, any stoves or food or whatever in the winter. So the Americans were uh, there helping to organize German business and get things going again. And one day, as my mom was going across the only bridge in town that was still viable, um, she ran into a girlfriend of hers. And this girlfriend said, oh, I I have this interview with the Americans, but I'm so afraid to go. I don't want to go and, and be interviewed by these Americans. And my mother said, I'll go. And she did. She took her spot. Um, she went to the Americans where she wowed them with her German and her French and her English. She wowed them with her English because that's what they wanted to hear, right? Um, she started working for them. She always likes to tell um, about the, the uh, captain that was in charge. He was from Texas, and he drawled. And she was trying to be, you know, listen really carefully and translate. And, you know, but she, they, they uh, sort of took her. This is, this is my mom at this point in time. Uh, they sort of took her under their wing, and they kind of liked having this cute Fräulein. And, um, that translated and went around with them to various businesses and, and uh, helped them set things up. And so uh, things were going well. Um, they went around, uh, the, the captain from Texas, um, 
was very proud of his Fräulein uh, that he had here, uh, and the fact that she was really intelligent to translate and do all that stuff was even better. Uh, and so he took her around to show her off at the office, and that's where she met my dad. <laughs> this was Captain Macafoos, Captain John, Captain Mac, they called him Captain Mac. Um, and so uh, pretty soon they, uh, my dad got a Jeep and they went out for a date. Uh, and my mother, she said it took her two days to figure out what to wear. Oh, I was going to show you. She wore that suit because that's the only suit she had. Uh -huh. So every day, that's what she wore. Um, and, the, and she borrowed, oh, she had gloves, and she, she had, you know, she wore her suit, and when she went on the first date. Um, so the, the romance started, uh, but I do have a, another little story. Do we have time for the ocelot coat or not? Possibly not. Possibly not. Oh, all right. Okay, no ocelot coat. Um, my mo well, real quick. My mother goes to Berlin. The Russians don't want her to come back. They don't want to let her back across the zone. Uh, but the lieutenants that she had gone with, she went to check on her dad who was in Berlin. But the lieutenants that she'd gone with, let me show you, there she is in her ocelot coat. Um, she, um, they, they knew that they had to get her back or else the captain would not be happy. So they worked uh, up and rode up and down until they could find a Russian officer who was willing to negotiate with them. And my mother was allowed to escape back into the American zone for three cartons of cigarettes and five K rations. Uh, and this is a piece of that ocelot coat that she was wearing. So thank you very much for allowing me to share a little bit of the German today inside. Thank you. Good evening, all. How are you all doing today? I am going to keep it brief, okay? I know we are all ready for dinner right now. Uh, my name is Papa Njai, and uh, as Mr. Troutman said, I'm a geographer, so we talk, tell stories using maps. And I also teach cultural anthropology, so I will just keep it very, very brief. When he called me, and this afternoon I was trying to put some few slides together, I said, what am I going to talk about anyway? And uh, what I always wanted to ask, I said, how many of you have been to Africa in the first place? Let's start from there. How many of you have been to Africa? Number three, excluding Mr. Troutman. Wonderful. So that is why I brought up some maps, but uh, before we get into the discussion itself, three things that we are going to do, just to be free. Look at Africa before the Europeans came. We call that the pre-colonial Africa. Africa during colonial rule, and then post-colonial, which is my assignment, and I will keep that one to about a minute or two minutes or three minutes, just to show you some images of people who worked so hard to give us back the freedom that we've been longing for for a very long time. I grew up in a tiny country called Sierra Leone, about the size of South Carolina. Population, about 7.5 million people. I'm the first to go to college, so I am on the receiving end. Your mom witnessed the whole thing. I am from the other side, um, from the continent of Africa, where Europeans, sometimes, according to us, the historians or scholars out there, we say, was used misused and sometimes abused okay but we are going very quickly here and i have this very interesting thing from a scholar or philosopher Pliny the elder out of africa there is always something new it was true then and up till today it is very true but this is what we are looking for what me dr kwame Nkrumah. okay he said seek first the political kingdom and all other things will come onto it we all know, you and I know, after 1960s, things didn't go the way we really wanted. So in Khaled, we always say, seek first the political kingdom, and all other things will be subtracted from it. We want, had a lot of problems, education, politics, corruption, and you name it. That is the image that a good number of us have about Africa today. If I'm giving the same presentation in Sierra Leone, my native country, it will be, who helped you gain independence? We always say, the mosquitoes. 
the mosquitoes pushed the British out of tropical Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone was called the white man's grave. I can paraphrase what Mrs. Falcon Bridge once said, that it was customary every morning to wake up and ask how many people died last night. So when we asked for independence, they were just horrid enough to say, hey, go ahead, thank you, go ahead, we are giving it back to you very quickly. This is the image of Africa in a nutshell, excluding New Sudan. So we are not getting into everything out there. I will just touch on it very, very quickly. Next is the image of Africa, since always I guess that a lot of people have no idea about how big the continent is. This is, um, uh, 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 what's the name, South Sahara or Africa. And uh, you can see United States, you can see Argentina, you can see the whole of China with 1.3 billion people. I can squeeze in um, Europe with over six, 700 million people and India's 1.1 billion or 1.2 billion people. Since we are in America, I will give you that three times the size of the United States, including Alaska. So this is what, I cannot do justice to talk about the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa in less than 10 minutes. I will not forgive you for that, Mr. Trotman, anyway. Okay, but we have to try. This is the human, bad place of human, you know, of human beings, according to us, the anthropology. This is where we all started, Adam and Eve, and then we walked out of Africa about 70,000 years ago. But this lays the foundation about how Africa looked like before the advent of the Europeans. We had civilizations. You've heard about uh, the empires, Mali, Songhai. Okay, Mansa Musa went up to Saudi Arabia you know, on a pilgrimage. Nobody asked him to go there. He ventured to go out there, became a converted a Muslim, and then brought back a lot of scholars and architects to build one of the most robust universities in sub-Saharan Africa, the library of the, um, Timbuktu and the University of Sankofa, Sankora. So this were, there were things already happening before the Europeans came. You can go down to Southern Africa very quickly and talk about Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe simply means um, the house of stones ancient civilization, just like the pyramids in Northern Africa. So there were things happening out there, and of course, this is when Europeans came, now they had to deprive, of, uh, deprive us of all of these very interesting things out here. Then we were dragged, kicking and sc screaming, into the global capitalist system, what is called slavery, about 11.5 million people left sub-Saharan Africa, excluding those that went ar uh, across the Sahara Desert to, into parts of Europe and Asia today. So a lot of things happened, okay, how we became part of this international system. But this, again, of course, you can see the massive profit. We don't have time for that one here for the sake of time. I will just skip this one very quickly. But this changed the fate of Africa, the Berlin Conference. 13 European countries, not even a single African, an African king, or an African professional, someone from the country, to come in and tell them about the do's and the don'ts. They looked at Africa from a distance, over maybe cups of coffee, if there was coffee at that time. I'm sure beer must be available at that time anyway. But this is the way, sitting around a table, they were able to try to carve up the entire continent that we have today. The conflict that started after the independence, or even before independence out there, we are all the product of some of these very interesting challenges that they left for us. Why we are they interested in Africa? Well, E. Pliny the Elder says, out of Africa there is always something new. We knew there were three. We divide them into three broad reasons. Number one, we can say, always say economic. Okay, looking for resources. Europe was industrializing. They needed resources to feed their industries in Western Europe, especially tropical material. So Africa was one of them. Asia was another. Silver, gold, and other things from Latin America. So that was the number one factor that we talk about in class, why Europeans were interested in sub-Saharan Africa, or let's just say Africa, as I like to say. Number two, to spread Christianity. Okay? They think it's a moral obligation. Africa was called the dark continent. Okay? That, uh, of course, we are the land of the heavens, you know, people that are paganistic practices. So it was their own moral obligation to bring Western civilization and Christianity to bring us to the word of God. That is number two. And the third one will say, you have to put in your flag a political control. If it is not controlled, your union jack is not there, then it is not, it's up for anyone. So these are the three. In our class, we say the three Gs, gold, gold, glory. Or the three Cs, Christianity, commerce, and of course, civilization. But the impact on the continent was massive. That alone can be an hour-long presentation.
But we got to start there to see what then prompted our own nationalist, okay, our own pan african to say, this is not right. Okay, we also have to forget our own freedom. And I love the last quotation by this student out there. It's a very powerful one. But look at just a quick summary. They had to bring in a lot of different types of crops. Okay, so for the first time in history, Africa moved from a continent or territories that were self-sufficient, able to feed themselves, to self-insufficiency. Now we have to produce crops that we never consumed in the first place. Coffee, cocoa, tea. These are not things that can add any proteins to your body out there, but we are, we, we are growing this thing to ship back to Western European capitals. Rubber for their automobile and other things. Of course, palm oil to make soap and other things. Land tenure system. Africa moved from a communal land ownership to a system generating more cash crops for them. European languages. That is why I'm speaking to you in English language today. It is not number one, not number two, not three, not on number four on my list of languages. I just use it to get my paycheck at the end of the month. <laughs> Wonderful. The infrastructure, we can argue, was not there to promote development either. Both us were redrawn, and these caused so many problems. The youngest nation in the world today, you all know, two years old, South Sudan. And we can spend a whole time how that mess started out there. So there are a lot of challenges that I just wanted to talk about. We do not have time. My ethnic language, Fula, which I speak at home, is divided in more than three, four, five countries. My own aunts, my uncles live on the other side of the border. They speak French. I grew up in an English-speaking environment. So they are, we are all moving back and forth today. So these are the enormous challenges left behind. And of course, in position of taxation, you all know, taxation without representation was responsible for the Boston Tea Party out here some decades or centuries ago. Indirect rule and also direct rule. These are all things that built up a lot of anger okay, within the African continent. Why are you doing these things for us? I love maps. Look at the movement across Europe. Look at the Egyptian, the British. Of course, we are very strategic. They needed the Suez Canal, the River Nile, to penetrate into the heart of Africa. They needed the south from the Cape Coast, going through the Rhodesias, okay, to get access to all the precious resources in that area. And my tiny country, Sierra Leone, was had, of course, many people say, one of the, the third largest natural harbor in the world. They needed all of these things. Strategically, Ghana was next door with lots of gold, and of course, Nigeria. This is how they partitioned Africa, what we call the scramble for, and the partitioning of Africa. By 1918, the picture has already can tell you all. All of these European powers, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, okay, and of course others, and you know, did I say Portugal, we are all carved up the entire world, but I'm more interested in Sub-Saharan Africa, that is probably by far the most affected. We do not have one single language. We have close to anywhere from a thousand to three thousand languages, and then we are just sitting down drawing boundaries. Similar groups that have the same language, subdivided, and that led to a lot of problems. Now we start very quickly, as I said, I'm going to be very, very brief because of time. What, how, what start laid the foundation okay, for nationalism or decolonization? We point out, we say very quickly, World War I. It was a turning point in our own history. Germany was a very big uh, key player on the African continent, holding on to many, many um, territories. But after World War I, what happened? Germany was defeated. Two million Africans participated in the war. That is about a percent of Africa's population, directly or indirectly. With the defeat of Germany now, what happened now? They said, we are going to take those territories away from you. Again, Africans were never consulted. Britain, France, and of course, South Africa was, you know, <clears throat> took over Cameroon, okay, Togo, and Southwest Namibia went under um, South African control. Belgium took over Rwanda and Burundi, and last but not the least, Britain acquired Tanganyika. We call that country today Tanzania, and of course Zanzibar next door. This is the beginning. African resistance was spoiled, so they were calm, but expectations were very high. They say, we've helped them fight the Germans. So maybe after World War I, they are going to give us back our freedom. It didn't happen. So they really kept behind. But a lot of people are still pushing. 
Okay, the interesting thing, they brought Christianity, they brought Western education. I went to a very tiny school, my elementary school, about the size of this one, divided into four. So they brought education and the Bible, and we turned it upside down and tell them, hey, you said God said we are all equal. Why are we, why are we not equal on the ground out there in Africa? But number two, after World War I again, with all of the rebellions now going down, things getting much quieter now, World War II came. This was the beginning now of what we call the dissolution of the entire empires, all of the European empires across the world. Okay? But again, Africa this time had two choices. We helped them World War I, nothing happened. What about World War II? Okay? So the choice was A, okay, still work with what we call the bourgeois imperialists, the British and of course the French, or you work, you know, you work with the Germans, what we call the threat of Nazism and of course fascism. Or I will simply say, the devil that you know versus the new devil that you really don't know. The choice was very simple. Let's work with the British. This time, we are going to see what we can do. But everybody was hanging, sitting right on the fence until uh, Italy came back after being once humiliated by the Ethiopians in the 1890s. They wanted to come back again to fight for that lost glory. They attacked, mistakenly attacked what's the name Ethiopia today was then called Abyssinia. Haile Selassie was sent into exile. That was the, period, the, the thing that really galvanized all of the African we became. Because Ethiopia was once was regarded as our own superpower. The only country that was able to defeat an imperial power. African Americans, people from the Caribbean, all emboldened. All across Europe, especially in London, people became so infuriated. So when the British came to Africans again, and the French said, help us, let's go and get the Italians out of that area. People were ready to go. Volunteers, even from North America, we are all willing to sign up to go back and fight. Over 300, 400,000 people from my own British West, Af uh, West African nations or some English-speaking nations all participated. They were able to squeeze the Italians out of present-day Ethiopia. Haile Selassie, the Lion of Judah, was brought back and restored to power. These are some of the interesting things that really happened. And what happened now after World War II? Let's fast forward very quickly. The Europeans became very bankrupt. Europe was destroyed. We all know that. The Marshall Plan was there, but it was not enough to fix the social and economic problems that were really going on in that area there. But what happened again? Africans who participated during the war came back. Some went back to their villages, others remained in the cities. For the first time in history, they were so, so politically conscious. Okay? They say, what happened in World War I? We'll forgive you. This time, we are going on. So the number of not only the veterans who are politically conscious, who are also getting more young, educated Africans. Educated in Africa, my university, Frobe College, was established in 1827. That is the oldest black institution in sub-Saharan Africa. Others went to London and others came out here in America. So the cry, yearning for freedom, grew louder and louder. Now let's look at what happened again, other post-war event. Okay, Britain no longer there, very much tired. Okay, France humiliated several times by the Germans. Now, for the first time now, America was emerging as a superpower next to Russia. Both of them were not interested in owning colonies, and they were not big fans of empire building. President Roosevelt was now talking to his colleague, Churchill. We got to put an end to colonialism. Let's prepare these new territories now for full-blown independence. Churchill was not willing to listen. It's very interesting. Okay, so they signed, unfortunately, two things happened. The establishment of what we call the United Nations in 1945. More countries in other parts of the world, we are getting their independence. We know then that, what's the name, India gained independence in 1947. Gandhi was able to do that. If the Indians can do that, what about us? We, they already know Haiti, all the way in the 1808 or 1804, if my memory is right, gained their, the first black republic to kick out Napoleon's army. If they can do it, what about us? These are interesting questions that a lot of African intellectuals we are really looking. The Atlantic Charter, signed by Churchill and uh, Roosevelt. It just simply says, the right of all people to self-determination. 
Okay? No more persecution or protection against aggression and persecution. When Churchill came to Africa, they said, no, 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 no. This is not for you. You guys are already doing fine. We are going to give you more education and more administrative positions. People said, no. De Gaulle was also in Brazzaville, promising more freedom. But people say, independence now or never. This is the very interesting thing that how. So I am going to add one more slide here. I'm going to summarize it into four. Each one of them can take us another half an hour, but this is just enough for the short period that we have here. The struggle for political freedom in Africa, we said they are divided into four. But sometimes overlapping. One did not begin or end. We use them sometimes interchangeably. Number one, the pre-war elite, the intellectual that I just talked about who studied here, studied in London, connected with our colleagues in the Caribbean, worked with African-Americans out here too again. And then what happened? They said, we are going back to seek freedom for our own continent. Number two, I've talked about Ethiopia. Ethiopia, the, no, the attack or invasion by the Italian invading Ethiopia also galvanized Africans again to move in very quickly and say, we are going to put an end to this. And number three, again, sometimes some people used force. Other people say, no, non-violent, just positive action, civil disobedience. I just call that the Gandhian philosophy. Gandhi was just from fresh from London, highly educated, was in South Africa. So what the South African, the white population doing there against the colored and of course the African, he laid that foundation. Nkrumah, Kaunda, several others say we are going to use the non-violent strategy. That is another way again how we use to gain our own independence. And the last but not the least, I always like armed engagement, call it the guerrilla warfare. This is what I just summarized here. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but just in a few seconds here, this is phase one. I just want to elaborate on this one a little bit. One, when we say the intellectual engagement or the elite, okay, but sometimes it included trade unions. He's a highly educated. The first president of Sierra Leone was a trade unionist. The president of Guinea was a very fierce trade unionist. So a lot of these people were also using the power of their own for areas that they control, whether it's diamond mine, whether it's gold, whether it's copper, even railway workers. I have another one. Taxi drivers were organizing themselves. Fishermen, everybody, especially in cities, we are all across rising up against European rule. Now, there is, these are the nationalists. I just put them together. I said, West African nationalists. This one can take us a whole hour. But Leopold Seda Senghor, one of the most brilliant Africans, who coined the word negritude, black pride, connected with his college, Amy Césaire, in, uh, in the Caribbean. They worked together in France to create what we call L'Etudien Noir. Noir a journal that connected black Africans. But that is just one. Sekou Touré just talked about him. A militant, also a philosopher, poet, Amical Cabral from Guinea-Bissau. Nandi Azikwe came to America, went to Howard University, not Harvard, Howard University is a HBCU, mentored other Africans to come to America and study. Interacted with African Americans again, looked at their own plight, the challenges that they are facing, say, we are going to liberate our own country. Edward Blyden, well-educated, grew up in Sierra Leone, Liberia, connected all across West Africa, and of course, Casely Hayford. Casely Hayford wrote probably the earliest novel about Africa in 1911, called Ethiopia Bound, which is widely read around the world. Okay, moving people, showing people to exploitation, challenges that Africans are facing, both within the continent and also in other parts of the world. This is what I call the father of African Pan-Africanism, um, and what is the name, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He came here under the lead and mentor, and mentorship of Nandi Azikwe, went to Pennsylvania in a car, you know, what is the name, um, the Howard University, one of these historically black colleges too, went over to London, wanted to study law, gave up, and then said, let's go back to Africa and fight. But he was 50, 60 years ahead of his own peers. He not only wanted independence, but he wanted the continental unity of all of Africa as what we call the United States of Africa, which is being debated today. East, Central Africa had also orders. I just chose three. Patrice Lumumba, murdered a couple of months after taking power in Belgian Congo. Julius Mirere, Tanzania. Kenyatta, in Kenya. North African nationalist, Gamal Abdel Nasser, you've probably heard about him in Egypt, Habib Bourguiba, powerful trade unionist, 
Bembela in Algeria. We are also fierce guys. We are also constantly fighting against the European domination. Because I was such in a hurry, I say I don't have pictures for these ones. Serexikama, Bekwana land, today we call it Botswana. Robert Mugabe, most of you have heard about him. Okay, had the push in southern Rhodesia, it's called Zimbabwe today. Kenneth Kaunda, Kamuzu Banda. And of course, that is a whole different ball game when we talk about the ANC, African National Congress. In the 1940s, they were all you know, leaders like Mandela, but before him, all, you know, people like Albert Lutoli and Oliver Tambo. They were also using both the Gandhian method. When it failed to work, they had their own military wing called the Nkomtu Wizis. We say we are going to use guerrilla warfare to get the you know, white minority to roll out of South Africa. But we can't continue talking about decolonization without talking about the role that America played. One, just fighting the European, putting an end to what happened over there, but also some key players, W.E. Du Bois, you've heard about him, one of the probably the first African Americans to go to Harvard, highly educated, was also working with his colleagues, Kwame Nkrumah and other people. Marcus Garvey, well known in American history today, or if you are studying other African history, Amy Cesare, these are all poet philosophers. I just put them into the African people of African ancestry, but some of them were either pacifists who were taking it very, very slowly, other people were more militant. What I just tried to say, the African diaspora, there are dozens and dozens of them that we do not have time to talk about tonight. I added one more thing out here. Uh, what happened? These are all what we call liberation struggles, and because of time, I don't want to get into all of these things. What people fail, they say negotiation is not working. Some countries gain their independence, but some Portuguese speaking countries, they realized that Portugal was so broke and they desperately needed their own cowardice. They wanted a place where they can send back their own un unemployed from Portugal. Okay, so what happened? They weren't ready to leave. And uh, Amical Cabral in Guinea Bissau said, we are going to use force this time to get these people out of this area. Parts of Kenya, parts of Rhodesia, the Rhodesias, both north and south, and Namibia, right down to South Africa, they needed armed struggle to get the British. And of course, another force again was what we call religion, Islamic resistance. That can take another ball time again just to talk about this thing. But North Africans from Algeria to Sudan, the Mahdi's, or what we call the Mahdiya, the Sokoto in northern Nigeria, Senegal under you know, uh, what's the name, Omar Tal, Christian resistance, not the mainstream Christianity, but they brought Christianity. What the Africans did was to indigenize it, to Africanize Christianity, looking at it from their own point of view. They say, God had a message for black people. Why would he send a white person to come and tell us? So there were a lot of people who were building African, homegrown African churches that were also resisting colonial rule. And of course, the formation of the Organization of African Unity. This is probably will be my last slide. This worked. After the 1960s, a lot of countries gained their independence. Few were still out there, and they were there to be that international voice to work with the United Nations to say, let's be free the other remaining countries now across, the, across, subs, you know, across Africa. Okay, this is the map of Africa, not the most accurate one. Ghana led the way in 1957, and of course others right through the 1970s. Namibia right through the 1990s. We can even add when Eritrea broke away from Ethiopia in 1993, and the challenge is still going on for Spanish Sahara, which is the western part of Af northwestern parts of you know, Africa. This is the Spanish Sahara here, yet to gain its independence. And of course, this is the new Sudan, okay, formerly part of the major you know, you know, no, um, Sudan, Africa's largest territory, just gained its own independence. We cannot call that colonial rule, but it's all the after effects of what we call the brutal, you know, the putting together countries or territories or ethnicities that had absolutely nothing in common, just put together. And then we see all of this conflict, and we just say, African, these people like to fight. Well, it was way back in the mid-1800s, the Berlin Conference that changed the way we do business. And uh, that is probably what I wanted to add here, and this is just me. I call it the decolonized African. My colleague always tells me I always like to wear my suit. I say, no, I do wear on weekends my own African food, my African language, and of course, this is the way I dress when I'm not suited up. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Hi, folks. Is this, a, a, is this about the correct, is that too loud? 
Is that good? Yeah. Are we happy with that? Okay. I'll try to keep it at this point. Um, what I'm going to very briefly, I'm going to kind of whiz through and we can leave things for questions. I'm going to try to talk to you tonight uh, about the emergence of the Cold War and the communist world after. So I'm going to take you through about uh, the first five years after World War II. I'm going to spend most of the time on that. Um, and I'm going to be very brief. Uh, and then what, how this gets set up over the next 40 years. Um, something that Papa brought up really, that I think was really important uh, that we really totally lose sight of is the idea that really um, we, we think that this communist movement was some sort of thing equivalent to the Nazi movement. In fact, it really is one wing, one wing of the world trade union movement. So that's a really important thing to think about, is that most of the anti-colonialists all over the world saw at the end of World War, World War II, and particularly at the end of World War I with the Russian Revolution, they, they really did, you know, we don't see it that way here because we talk about freedom and liberty, but the rest of the world sees the communist world as the way that was going to free them from the long 150-year yoke of the Western Europeans. Remember, look at what we're walking into in World War II. Great Britain, our ally, controls and colonizes one-fifth of the Earth's surface, and Germany wanted a piece of that. So what happens? Soviet Union, huge, um, enormously... Uh, uh, prestige after the Second World War. Um, but guess what happens? This degenerated form of communism, you can look at a lot of scholars that talk about this, this degenerated form of communism, there are other forms uh, that could have emerged, they didn't. <laughs> Joseph Stalin took over and they are allowed in the, after the war, they expand the borders of the Soviet Union and they occupy most of Eastern Europe, with the exception of Yugoslavia and Albania. They are not occupied. Uh, Yugoslavia, I remember about two months ago I presented on this, uh, Yugoslavia frees itself uh, with its own communist partisans. So basically, by 1948, uh, the people's democracies have these either engineered uh, coup d'etats or uh, some call them revolutions by domestic communist forces backed by the Red Army. So all of Eastern Europe is incorporated somehow into the Soviet bloc. So these countries are added. Yugoslavia breaks in 1948. But most of these countries, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, the newly reformed and um, reconstituted Poland, as well as uh, what eventually becomes uh, the German Democratic Republic, not quite so democratic though. Uh, boom, let's move on. Uh, the roots of the Cold War, most scholars talk about, happen in the Greek Civil War between 1946 and 1948. Basically what's happening? The communist forces, uh, who were the most ardent fighters of the German occupation and the Italian occupation, uh, ended up having lots of arms at the end of the war. The British and the Americans want to reinstall who? Uh, the German royal family back into uh, Greece. So guess what? The armed communist forces, the partisans like Tito's partisans, they want to keep uh, their share or their foothold or their hegemony in, um, in uh, Greece. Fighting uh, uh, breaks out. What you see here, the females, that's uh, uh, armed partisan Elam or Elas uh, uh, forces. The communists are, always had um, women in combat, and below there are some other Chetniks. But what happens? Fighting breaks out, but Stalin uh, decides that Greece, he doesn't want to antagonize the Allies in a war. Basically, he says, fold up your operations. Tito has to fold up. And guess what? The, 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 so the communist bloc re removes its support in Greece, and the U.S. sends in huge amounts of uh, forces and support. The Truman Doctrine is established. Truman, Truman Doctrine saying basically the U.S. will try to contain 
uh, the spread of communism through um, through uh, spread of arms or U.S. Uh, military action. So we established the Truman Doctrine of Containment in the Greek Civil War. So the Greek Civil War is sort of the beginning of this worldwide confrontation between U.S. and, and Soviet Union uh, via these sort of proxy wars. So they're cold wars for us, but they're hot wars for everyone else who unfortunately has to fight these. Uh, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh came to the 1919 peace conference and said, can we be free? They said, uh, they, uh, they told him back in 1919 to go suck it. Uh, he, he went back to Indochina and fought the entire 1920s and 30s to, uh, for Vietnamese independence, didn't get it then. He fought, he had American military advisors in with him in, during the Second World War. He was given promises that uh, Vietnam would not be recolonized. Oops, it was recolonized by the French. Fighting breaks out between the Viet Minh, which was the combination of uh, communist and nationalist forces in Vietnam. And guess what? They beat the pants off the French finally in 1954 in Dien Bien Phu. Uh, but in the 1940s, they get uh, North Vietnam. So guess what? Right here at the end of the war, the seeds of the French war in the 1950s and then our involvement in the 1960s and 70s were laid right here at the end of World War II. I'm not, and uh, Ho Chi Minh, I put him on the north, uh, who was backed by uh, the Soviet Union, and then Emperor Bai Dao, who was backed by the French and the uh, United States. You see the pattern emerging already. Who, do, who does the West back? reinstall royalists and empires or sometimes even stooges of empires. Maybe, maybe some bad policies there. This was a huge hit the, um, in 1949 to American policy. Uh, American uh, policy strategi strategists see it as the loss of China. So the revolution, the defeat of the Kuomintang, the nationalist forces, uh, by Mao Zedong's uh, communist forces, uh, brings the most populous nation in the world, I believe even at 1949, it was the most populous nation in the world, into the communist orbit. So now the seeds even of the Korean War are, are uh, uh, basically at the doorstep of the Chinese Revolution. Uh, one point, I didn't put a North Korean slide in here, but the leader, the eventual leader of North Korea, Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung, was actually a fighter against the Japanese during World War II in Chinese, uh, in, um, Chinese and Soviet-backed military units, uh, while the guy who would eventually take over the South, uh, Sing Min Rhee, was, I believe, in Hawaii. So, Mm, who, you know, you, could, you do see kind of the, the pattern. Who was really fighting the Nazis and the Japanese? All these guys who we would eventually call the dirty, filthy Reds. It is something good to keep in mind. Who, was, who were the biggest fighters, not only of fascism, but of what Papa very eloquently and much better than me put it, uh, um, colonialism. So by 1950 and eventually by 1959, off the coast of Miami, Little Cuba, uh, the map of many communist nations would look like this. So what is laid, what are the seeds laid here? Not only do we have an ideological conflict between free, uh, free market ideologies in the West and planned state economies in the East, but also you have um, the idea of frustrated uh, colonial expansion in the West. You have the idea of frustrated revolution in the East. Uh, uh, you have the, the uh, frustrated claims of many trade unionists in the East. Um, but this is all during the Cold War, boiled down to conflicts between, at least how, how it's presented to us here in the West, was conflicts between freedom and slavery, although there's something to be said about this. Uh, these were not workers' paradises, uh, despite what some of our, our uh, propaganda that I've even read says. These were not workers' paradises, but um, they were actual, genuine enthusiasm on the part of the people, especially the Red Army, to defeat 
Nazism, there was actual real enthusiasm on the part of the Chinese peasantry to drive out the Guomintang. Uh, there was actual real enthusiasm on the part of the Cuban people to drive out the mafia-led uh, uh, buddies of, uh, what, what's his name, Batista, uh, thank you, George, uh, in Havana. They were, they, I mean, so, and uh, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh were actually supported by probably vast majority of the people. So you, you, we do have to think about this and think, you know, was this all cynical manipulation from Moscow or did maybe in a degenerated, odd way, uh, did this world communist movement, even though it was very opportunistic, jingoistic, and destructive to independent uh, workers' organization, it did encapsulate at least somewhat um, the ideas of some sort of a different world, even though that different world sometimes might be quite uh, disgusting. So this was the ideological conflict and the real world conflict uh, that was laid for the next five and 40 years after World War II. But these didn't, these, these conflicts didn't remain on the global sphere, they, they came home to the domestic sphere. We had our own brand of uh, anti-communism, McCarthyism, witch hunts, blacklists, not only in the movie and, and recording industry, but also in our labor unions. By 1947, we had blacklists in our labor unions. So our best organizers in the 1930s, many of the best organizers were left-wingers, socialists and communists. They were uh, kicked out of the labor movement by the 1940s, late 1940s, and who was left were careerists and, and uh, basically party kiss butts by the early 1950s. So uh, that's a little, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy, good, nice guy from the North, uh, films that maybe some of us have seen about the Red Menace. It's not what you think, it, they mean communism. Uh, and then these booklets about how uh, uh, Americans America was betrayed by all these so-called uh, communists within the State Department. They almost never found any. They almost never found any, and uh, the Army actually ended up shutting down uh, Joe McCarthy because he was basically destroying Army morale. And finally, what I mentioned, uh, after the war here in the United States, the biggest strike wave we ever had, 1946, during the war, there was a no-strike pledge. Uh, wages were largely frozen, and what happened, the workers in all the war industries and factories, even tomato pickers in the South, uh, organized and had a huge upsurge of labor. 1946 general strike was huge. Yes, they won a lot, and so this was the home front uh, right at the end of the war. Huge upswing of labor, uh, raising wages, but also the very next year they were, and a few years later, they were terribly punished by very bad labor legislation, legislation, which we'll all learn about in my labor studies class. So basically, what, what am I trying to, I'm basically concluding, because I know we've taken a lot of time here. Um, huge fallout from the war. The war was hugely consequential, but also many, I think probably many policy missteps after the war, backing the wrong people, certainly backing the emperor and the Catholic minority in Vietnam was probably an extremely undemocratic and wrong step backing French recolonization in Vietnam was probably a big wrong step uh, for American policy. Um, uh, uh, if you talk to some of my Macedonian friends, these were the children who fought on the communist side in the north because they wanted to secede from George's homeland. Uh, they were very frustrated. So. Uh, Basically, the next 40 years of the Korean War, Vietnam War, uh, many of our other um, conflagrations across the world, uh, the massive buildup of 25,000 warheads on each side, the ability to destroy the world 40 times over, was laid by the conflicts that emerged in the first five years after World War II, which you've been learning about the rest of this whole class. Uh, I'm going to conclude my brief, brief uh, moments there and just say thank you so much and thank you to all the presenters today.